Welcome to the Decipher podcast. My name is Dennis Fisher. I'm the editor-in-chief of Decipher. With me today is my colleague, Lindsay O'Donnell-Welch, and our friend, Ryan Narain, who was one of the co-founders of ThreatPost with me um, and is currently doing the Security Conversations podcast, writing at Security Week, and roaming around the desert on mountain bikes in his spare time. How's everybody Sounds doing? Good. Sounds good. Hi, Dennis. Hi, Lindsay. It feels like a little bit of a ThreatPost reunion here. It is. It does, yeah. Although I wasn't with the uh, OG crew like you guys, but <laughs> so it was unfortunately it came after. <laughs> Those early years were uh, were a little chaotic. We Before you guys though. get started, I'm a big fan of this podcast and the podcasting that you guys are doing. I notice you're doing a lot more uh, investing in this audio thing. Um, so more of that. Thanks, buddy. We took it from you. Like I, I took my cue from you where you were like, I don't know, five or six years ago, you were like, Writing's hard, man. I don't want to do that anymore. I think I'm just going to do podcasts. <laughs> yeah, because now you don't have to like decipher it and then re retranslate it to people. You just you, you have a conversation and that's the product. Yeah. Just talk to smart people and then go on about your day, which is, again, one of the great things about this job that we all get to do is like we get to talk to some of the smartest people in the industry who are our friends and you know we've known for a long time. And um, one of the reasons we wanted to have you on, Ryan, is we wanted to talk about in general terms, this Snowflake incident that happened over this past weekend as recording. Um, Snowflake, the company, not Snowflake as in like very online, like uh, young children <laughs> that, that can't handle criticism. Um, although who knows, but um, there, it was, there was a whole bunch of pieces to it. When Lindsay, you went to write the story on Monday morning, you were, we were texting back and forth and you were like, there's so much misinformation about this. I don't really know what, how to separate fact mm -hmm. from fiction. You know, there were original research pieces out there that had a lot of very wild claims in them. And one of the difficulties of the job that we all do is trying to separate those, you know, those threads of like, okay, we trust this organization, but I don't really know these folks over here. Um, so how did you, Lindsay, at, at the beginning sort of look at that and think, all right, I'm going to have to jump in here. Where do I, where do I find the, the real facts here? Yeah, I think it's really, it's difficult. And we've seen this time and again with different stories as they come out, because nothing is, first of all, some of the, the companies might not know what actually is real themselves. Like they're going through this same as we're watching it from the outside. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of kind of murkiness around uh, the details in the beginning as they come out. And you know, this story in particular was kind of indicative of how, in general, a lot of these incidents play out because there's always the company that's going to be targeted or got dinged. There's always um, the threat actors who are, you know, on the corner kind of making a stink or trying to have their own statement on the matter. And then there's the security community trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Yeah. And then there's uh, us, the reporters, who are trying to kind of figure out what do we need to, um, how can we accurately approach this situation and figure out what's fact versus what's fiction? Um, so I think that it, you know, for me, it really came down to the fact that it's, this is something that with a lot of different situations, a lot of cybersecurity reporters um, are kind of struggle with a situation like this. And, yeah. you know, in those types of situations, I look for, um, you know, solid facts, like confirmations, um, people and research teams that are looking at actual data and actual things that um, aren't just being thrown around. And then, so, you know, for me, like the Mandian and CrowdStrike statement stuck out um, as, you know, okay, this is something that is solid that I can kind of, you know, go from there and try to better understand what's going on here. Um, but there was so much there, you know, there was a lot of different pieces. Yeah, I think that's the reason Snowflake brought in Mandiant and CrowdStrike was just to have that rubber stamp of like, listen, this is not just us saying it. We brought in some external third party people to just kind of put some clarity on this thing. This one was especially complicated. I, I was talking to Ayanats, one of the reporters at Security Week. He actually covered this story. And he says, on average, when these things are happening, it takes me about 30 minutes to kind of grasp who's saying what, what the big story is, what the nut graph is, like 30 minutes. He's like, two hours later, I'm still sitting there trying to figure out what am I writing here because of this. And there's like a lot to unpack with the original, how, it, how the whole story started with a company 
Hudson Rock. I had never heard of them before. I mean, if yeah. you go to their website, I'm not going to like, I don't know enough to dump on this company, but I, if you go to the website and spend five minutes, you'll know hey, this. Uh, these guys are making their money on the claim that they're communicating directly with threat actors. And this entire story was built around the fact that, hey, we got a, we, we saw these things for sale and we got in touch with the threat act and we were able to confirm it. And here's your story. And, and, and you know, everyone runs with it. And Snowflake is, I, I, there's no correcting that or like rewrite, no. re, re, you know, spinning back the wheels of that story. It's already gone. Then when their communication starts, there's not a lot of clarity to what they're saying. They're, they're not sure here. They're not. They brought in Mandiant and, and CrowdStrike to validate certain things. But like Lindsay said, the story still isn't clear or still wasn't clear. Then there's the whole shared responsibility thing. Is it our fault? Is it their fault? Is it whose fault it is? What's the baseline that determines when the responsibility is being shared or whose fate it is? There's so much to unpack in this story. In addition to it being, a, obviously, it would happen on a Friday night. Obviously, yeah. it would be just one of those things where it's impossible to think. And then one other thing Monkey Wrench to throw in the wheel here is like, Lindsay mentioned waiting for credible security researchers to come in and kind of give that independent outlook. Those guys are working for companies and those research reports are marketing documents. Like they go through PR firms, the marketing gets involved, it gets all tidied up on a paper and everyone wants their name associated with that as well. How much of that you can trust is up to, it's up to you. I mean, it's your own history with the company and who you're dealing with. It's, it's near impossible because the most important thing Lindsay said right at the beginning was a lot of these guys don't even know what's going on. There's a company called SciSense that had an April breach where CISA put out this advisory saying, hey, go change your default file. To this day, Sison still doesn't know what happened. I know this because the researchers who told them about the breach and who notified and worked with CISA to get that alert pushed out, I was working with them in the background on this particular breach. Like these guys, we, these guys are notifying Sison about what's going on. The CEO put out a nonsense thing yesterday with like patting himself on the back on how great they are. Meanwhile, even internally, a lot of these breach companies don't know or. And in many cases, in fairness to them, it's a real investigation, right? It's like it's taking time to determine what's yeah. going on and, and people want information live. But even when, they dis even when they distribute the information, you can't trust it. There's many, many examples of companies coming out a month and a half later to say, oh, it was weird. it's not what we originally said. It, it's actually worse than that. And that's become the common thing. So, yeah. It in a lot of that, I think, I mean, Ryan, we've, we've been in these situations a lot of times. A lot of that, I think, is the company sort of counting on the fact that the media will move on to the next story after, you know, it, not even just one day. It could be the ne two hours later, there could be another big story. And they're counting on the fact that the attention will sort of go away. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they'll eventually put out another blog post or, you know, if they're a public company in AK or something like that and say, here's what we've discovered here's what we have found in our investigation and that kind of stuff flies under the radar and it doesn't get the same pickup that the original uh you know huge blast radius incident does right you know, and we allow it to fly under the radar because we true. kind of accept the fact that it's very difficult in these wild investigations so if a company doesn't know how bad the breach is now they may know in three months and tell us in three months hey this is all kind of normal look at microsoft microsoft can't even uh, uh, protect their own platform the csrb report had to come out and really shell out at the highest level i mean dennis if you and I were asked to name three companies with like the premium security talent in the whole wide world, Microsoft would be at the top, like not even number two, Microsoft would be at the top. Impossible to protect their own network, right? Not only impossible to protect their own network, but impossible for them to even know how bad things are until later on. It's impossible for them for boot. The Russians are still in there. They're still struggling to boot out the Russians. Like this is the reality at, at the most well-resourced company with the most security talent you can think of. What do you expect at other places? What do you expect at Snowflake? What do you, the size sense company that I'm talking about. I mean, this is a breach that with major supply chain implications kind of went under the radar. The company doesn't even have a CISO. It's like they, you go to their website, there's a, there's a CEO, a head of marketing, a, a, a lawyer, and, and these companies are patting themselves on the back for doing well. And as an industry, we've kind of just, eh, this is just the way it is. Like there's, this is, this is the default best scenario. So 
you know me, I'm a curmudgeon and a, and a, and a pessimist in this all. Um, I feel like you and I, we've seen all of this before. None of this is new. Um, it's getting progressively worse because there's a massive business model attached to it now that's not going away. There's nation state implications. There's a lot of governments turning a blind eye to this thing. So it'll stay forever. I mean, yeah, we'll be writing these stories and we'll be talking about this forever. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I was going to ask both of you guys, because, you know, you have been in the industry for so long, how you've seen in Ryan, you just kind of address this, but how you've seen this change, but specifically the, um, you know, attention to what threat actors are saying, because I feel like there is a lot of um, a lot more emphasis in the journalism, cybersecurity journalism world on kind of what threat actors have to say. And obviously that's that's a little dangerous, right? When especially with ransomware actors you know, potentially using that to exert pressure in some situations. Hey, yeah. Listen, can I jump in quickly, Dennis? Because this Go has ahead. been on my hackles yeah, for a long time. Journalists that hang out on leak sites and call the companies and say, hey, we uh, there's a leak site claiming that you and trying to embarrass a company into providing them information and being wittingly or unwittingly used by cyber criminals to do this kind of extortion and naming and shaming extortion. They're, I, I don't think they qualify to be called journalists. And I feel like a lot of the publications that uh, um, clickbait chase articles based on in, based on, you know, MGM infection, we know because we spoke to the threat actor, like, I don't know, it doesn't feel right with me. I know there's a, there's an urgency to figure out what's going on. Everyone wants to be first, you know, information is information. If the information is there and I find it there and it's newsworthy, it's newsworthy. We can have all those arguments. I feel like if your entire business model is predicated on being used by threat actors as part of their extortion plots, something is off completely. And, uh, and a lot of a lot of reputable publications I see is guilty of this. A lot of people I expect better from are guilty of this. Like I don't even I don't hang out on on the leak sites on no. purpose, you know. Yeah, I've never been comfortable with that. I mean, it's we all know how to find them and where they are and that sort of thing. I've never been comfortable with that that idea of communicating directly with attackers. I don't see what the benefit no value, is. Yeah. Yeah, what's what's the value to our audience in being like, hey, I talked to this bad guy in country X Y Z, and he said he did this. Like, yeah. who cares? And he says he has X number of things, and he's selling it for twelve million dollars. Yeah. And like, here's how you here's how you reach him. And I'm like, where? What are you a go between now? It's I, that's how it feels. It feels like you're a go between, uh, pretending to be a journalist chasing traffic. This feels and and in some cases you never know. It feels like very much like you could be in cahoots with these guys. It just feels ugly and abnormal. And I, I wish like more reputable news publications would avoid going down yeah. this route. It, it's not something we, we do here and it's not something I was ever like really into. I, I remember early, early on in my, in our career at eWeek, Ryan, um, I got an email. This was back in the days of like the DDoS crews. And like, that was basically all there was in like 2004 or five or something like that. Got an email from somebody claiming to be the crew that had taken down, I don't know, it was a bunch of like government sites at the time, like federal US government sites. And I was like, oh my God, okay. So I ended up like getting in contact with the FBI, like going through all this. They didn't even have a cybersecurity division at the time. And some FBI agent eventually called me back and was like, hey, do you, can you just give us their email address and forward us the emails? Like, we don't know how to find these people. I was like, this is so weird. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't like this. At, want to be in. I not at all did not care for it at all. So I think that was like one of the sort of first indications that I didn't, I didn't really want to go down that road. Another point to make here, sorry to jump in, is like there's a, there are a lot of parasite companies operating peripherally in this space, pretending to be security companies, or mm -hmm. they're they're providing a security service, but they're in this murky world of we're in this we're we're on the leak sites, we're we are part yeah. of part, we're in the underground, we're monitoring the underground, and we're on man, and. I call them parasite companies. You go to their website and you can see, you can see that this feels very, very shady. There's some companies like you go to, you go to Google and you just type in ransomware support. Like you get infected. Oh, I'm gosh. a small business. I get infected. I go, yeah. I go. And you click on one of those companies that are offering legitimate ransomware support services. And then you realize where these people are just taking a cut of the ransom and they're all part and parcel of the thing. There's like, there are examples of this. Go to Google and search and, and land on some of these companies. And I feel like, 
in, in the journalism realm, we should start, when we see these parasite companies, we should start ignoring them and shaming them. Like uh, at, at some point, if we're pretending to be, or if we're proposing to be the independent middleman for information for our audience, then we need to be protecting that audience and, and naming and yeah. shaming those companies and so on. And I feel like, I mean, we're, Dennis, you and I are old timers. We could afford to say, hey, I'm not writing that story, right? There's a lot of young journalists get assigned it and they have to write it. There's a lot that's of right. that. And that's why a lot of these things happen. And, and I, also, like, there's so much to unpack, man. It's so difficult now to separate if if you're even relatively new in the cybersecurity journalism world, trying to to identify the companies that are legitimate. You know, I'm not talking about Mandy or CrowdStrike, obvious, but there's much smaller boutique firms that we all know that we can rely on because we know the folks there. We we might know the founders or something, Ryan. But if you're you know a 24 year old just out of J school, mm -hmm. you get thrown into the world. You don't know one from another, and and you can't really, you know sort of suss out who to trust when something like the snowflake breach happens. You, you, you sort of have all this stuff thrown against the wall and you're, you're just, you know, it's a really difficult situation. Yeah. That, I mean, could you imagine that being your first story as a okay. cybersecurity journalist? Like yeah. I would not know who to trust, like what to do. Um, I do feel like, you know, as a journalist overall, but especially in the cybersecurity industry, like you just need to have a really good um, gut feeling, I guess, about some of these situations and, you know, a lot of times I'll be looking at research or report or something and say, why did they say that? Or like, why would they make this attribution or just more generally, like, why did they choose to release this information? Mm -hmm. um, and just trying to like, look at each piece and saying, like, why? But then also, if something doesn't feel right, I always try to go with that because, right. yeah. you know, 90% of the time, it's usually there's something there. And lean on your network too. Like we all have a network of security researchers and people we talk to all the time. And these companies come out with a claim like this is where it, this is where like access to costing comes in handy. Someone makes a claim, an APT claim that X, Y, Z. I have within 10 seconds, I can lean on my network and say, hey, Costin, does this pass the smell test? Does this make sense? What does this look like? Then you get a, you, you get a, you get a real legitimate independent validation. We all have resources that we can use in this way. I mean, I, f I feel like a lot of people don't, just no. touch base with someone and say, hey, does this pass the smell test to you? Give me a feel for what you do here. I mean, that's part of good journalism too. Absolutely right. And it takes time, obviously, to build up those networks. But to me, that's, you know, a huge chunk of this job is trying is building those networks and finding out who the trusted people are and who you can rely on when something like this does happen. Or, you know, in the case of, say, you know, there's a major data breach and the CISO is getting in trouble and maybe there's some liability there because there's all these, you know, new regulations now and all that kind of stuff. You can get in contact with somebody, you know, who's a CISO or former CISO and be like, how does this all work? Like, you know, in this situation, exactly. who are you talking to? Like general counsel, first call, then the cops, then this, that, you know. A quick, quick, quick question for you. How much do you think is this SEC reporting requirements and all the drama around uh, breach disclosure? causes companies to hedge information they release very early on causes companies to just kind of it does do you think it gives them cover to downplay or do you think it's it's a legitimate legal thing to just like let's just go with what we know and then fit back fill it later on like how much do you feel like this this noise and chaos around reporting rules is affecting what we know and what we learn I think it's a little early to tell for sure right now, Lindsay, you can correct me, but I think what we've seen so far is uh, some companies, I wouldn't say over disclosing, but erring on that side of, listen, there, there's something here, it, you know, it was an incident. We don't know if any sensitive data was um, accessed yet, but it could be material, you know, down the line. We don't know yet. Here's a two paragraph 8K. It sort of gives us some cover if things go sideways in two weeks and we find out everything went to hell. But I think it's all going to evolve in the next few months as the people figure out what is material and what's not. You know, some of our friends we've talked to, Ryan, they're, they're like, not everybody knows what's material to their business. I hate to say that, but, you know, 
financial even materials. The SEC isn't quite clear on when they want it, people right. Read, but I, I yeah. saw some clarification issue just recently, and even in the clarification, I was left a little lost. But then again, I'm not the smartest person, and I don't quite understand it, it, things very well. SEC but. regs are not easy to read. Let's be <laughs> honest. I mean, none of us are are financial regulators, so right. But a lot of victim companies could also be hiding behind that. Hey, listen, the lawyers are taking care of that with the SEC regulations. We can't put out a blog post detailing uh, things. Yes. But, but when I you're snowflake, it. right? When you're yeah. snowflake, though, and you're holding data for others, and there's others, uh, there, there are third-party data involved for any of these companies, it, it takes on a different tone. And then there's the whole shared responsibility model that they're pushing, and that doesn't make any sense to me when things like this happen. So... I feel like there's a, a lot of narratives that play here and there's so much to unpack in this story that we could probably podcast for another hour. But I know. Yeah, that's that's an interesting piece too, was that, you know, just having the kind of motivation behind the statements that were made of saying, yes, this happened, but this is like the reason why and it wasn't us. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> just mm -hmm. like trying to understand, okay, but like what actually happened? Like what's actually the security weakness here? Like, what mm -hmm. could have been done to prevent this? Like, you know, all things aside of whose fault it was, like what could be better done in this situation? Um, yeah. Right. yeah. And it is turn on two factor authentication. And then how much of that is Snowflake's responsibility to like demand it for certain admin accounts? Like there's, there's, that's where the shared responsibility that, First of all, this shared responsibility and shared faith. When my data is lost, you're not sharing my faith. Like, it's my data. <laughs> like, this nonsense, like, how do we allow people to get away with this kind of terminology doesn't make any sense to me. It's not a shared responsibility either because you ship something out of the box and I expect a certain baseline level of security. And if, if it requires me having to, like, turn a million knobs to configure it properly just to avoid a little yeah. tiny leak that will bounce to something else like how is that my how is that my responsibility like, yeah i don't want to share any of that uh, yeah. it, it, i mean it's tangential but it also sort of reminds me ryan of the the recall um oh. feature that microsoft just put out in windows and yes you can go and turn it off but it's not in the gui it's you have to dig down like you turn it on by default all these dark patterns turn on by salesforce, default. salesforce salesforce uh, not salesforce slack using my 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 slack data to train their models okay yeah. you want to do that fine let me opt in give me a box and say hey we're doing this it's going to yeah. make things better for you here's how i incentivize it for you blah 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 i check box it and then we all go move our way the dark pattern is all these companies are turning it on by default and then you have to go through a million things to turn it off no one does that and then we end up here and yeah. and it's a shared responsibility right i it, i don't want any part of that and it shouldn't be none of that stuff should be by default honestly the default should be secure and more private for the user not we're going to snapshot your data and use it to train our models and maybe there's some benefit to you but we don't you know, you might not see it, but we might, you know, because we have more stuff. Yeah, so recall, I mean, recall, Satya Nadella is boasting about the, the amazingness of recall at a time, a week or two after he himself issued a press release that said security, security before features. And the, the security implications and privacy ramifications of this is so obvious to anyone with a brain. I mean, I saw a report today that malware authors are already figuring out a way to target this thing. I mean, it's just an, it's an obvious thing. And yeah. then you wonder, why should we take any of these companies seriously or take them at their word? You just can't believe them anymore. I know. Yeah. I mean, the, the tough thing is most of the time you should hold less data. Like you don't want to hold data. You don't want to gather more data than you need. But they're, you know, things like that are snapshotting all of this stuff from hundreds of million, millions of users. Right. It's sitting somewhere. It's sitting on the local device. Sure. But that just makes it, you know, it, it's a great... still a target. And we've already seen people coming out with tools that can dump that stuff, yeah. um, you know, and gain access to it. So attacks there's get a, better, not worse. a great interview. I encourage the listeners to go to YouTube and find a Wall Street Journal just did an interview with the CEO of OnlyFans. And they were going through, okay, how do you handle this data? How do you handle this data collection? And the answer throughout was, we handle it because we don't collect it. We don't collect any of this. We don't track this. We don't track this. We don't track this. And they've documented where they don't track anything. And that's the only way you can provide any sort of shared responsibility to user data is when you not, you don't collect any of it. Too yeah. many of these companies are addicted to the profits of, of monetizing that data and finding ways not only to monetize, even if I can't sell or monetize the data, how can I do compute against it 
to figure yeah. out trends and patterns and little things to improve my product and do some data uh, mining to yeah it's just something. ugly it's just ugly the cloud is the, the internet was a problem and the cloud exacerbated <laughs> it and now yeah. ai is going to kill it computers were a mistake the internet was a mistake the cloud huge mistake ai ai is going to kill yeah. it all so no nothing to worry about yeah. and security is just just lost we complain <laughs> too much there's a lot there's a lot of good happening there's a lot of um, of course uh, but... there's a lot of advancements in technologies ai is going to help in a million different ways but when companies are out to monetize everything and then they're not truthful and profits take precedence over you know user data and security and so on then it's time to be curmudgeons again <laughs> it's a good thing we're good at that it's yeah it is hard not to be a curmudgeon, I feel like. <laughs> it, it, it gets harder the older you get. I'm sorry to tell you, Lindsay. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> and then you stop caring and you don't want to get there. <laughs> you just go for mountain bike rides in the mountains. And you, yeah. With your dog. Yeah. All right. Ryan, thanks so much for coming on, buddy. Great to see you. Anytime. And uh, folks, go check out Ryan's podcast, Security Conversations. It's really good. Thanks, man. Cheers, guys. Bye. See you, Lindsay.